Right now, let's just um, take a couple moments together to join our hearts together in prayer as we just go before our great God and speak to Him. Father in heaven, we praise you. What a, what a great God you are. What a joy it is to know that we have such a great and awesome and glorious God. The God had three in one, Father, Spirit, and Son. We praise you, Lord God. And Lord Jesus, we praise you as the, the Son of God who is so great, and yet you humbled yourself to come into our world to become even a baby. Oh, Lord, what a, what a great God you are that you would somehow be able to take on human flesh. And we praise you, Lord Jesus, that you not only took on our nature, but that you even gave yourself on a cross to die for our sins, to pay the price so that we could be forgiven, and redeemed, and reconciled to you. And Lord Jesus, we praise you that therefore you have been exalted to the highest place. and You have been given the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we praise you, our great and glorious King and Lord Jesus. You are reigning over us, Lord. You came into our world, and now you are exalted high in heaven. And so we praise you, and we adore you, and we worship you this morning. We rejoice in you with joyful hearts. What a joy it is to know that you have come to be our Savior. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us as your people to share this good news of great joy with the world around us. Help us to be a people who proclaim to the world around us, joy to the world, the Lord has come. So that people in Garner, people in this whole area, and even to the ends of the earth, might know that Jesus Christ is the one true and living God and the Savior. Lord, we, we want to come before you this morning with our requests as well. And, and Lord, we thank you for Eric and Amanda Williams and their ministry with Ghost Earth Global in Peru. And we ask that you would provide the funding needed for, for the van to be purchased uh, so that Nelson and Bethany's ministry to go forward and use that man fruitfully for the sake of your kingdom. Father, we come to you with requests on behalf of, of those in our midst, Lord. We thank you for Don Copenbeetle that his scan show that his cancer is not growing, Lord. What a blessing that is. And we rejoice in your kindness to him. And we continue to pray for healing for Don. We pray for Barb Bogan and just the, the seizures that she's been dealing with, that you would bring healing to her and restore her. And Father, as we celebrate Christmas this week, I pray that you would help us to keep your son Jesus at the center of our hearts, that he would be glorified in our hearts, in our lives, in our celebrations. May Christ be central. Lord, I pray that you would help us to use our Christmas celebrations to share the love of Jesus with those around us, that others might know the greatness of your love as we share the love of Christ with them. And so, Lord, as we continue to worship you this morning, may you be exalted glorified and honored. Would you give us ears to hear your word? Would you fill our, our hearts with joy, fill our lips with your praises, and be exalted in our midst this morning? We pray all this through your son Jesus, in his name. Amen. Well, I want to welcome you to worship here at Garner Evangelical Free Church this morning. If you are visiting with us today, we want to extend a special welcome to you, and, and thank you for joining us to worship God this morning. Um, if you have a chance to, to take the tear-off portion of your bulletin and fill that out and, and drop that in the offering, uh, we would really appreciate that, just as a way for us to, to get to know you a little bit more. Um, just a few announcements this morning. First of all, our Christmas Eve service is going to be at 5 p.m. Tuesday evening, and during that candlelight service, we'll be taking the offering, um, and that offering is going to be split amongst our missionaries that we support as a church, just as a uh, Christmas gift to them. So just want to make you aware of that. Um, coming up at the end of January, uh, the 7th and 8th grade youth group will be going on a, a retreat to, to Hidden Acres for Winter Blast. And so if you have kids that are in 7th or 8th grade, um, we'd love to get them signed up for that. Um, the cost is $90, but um, if you would like some help with that, we can certainly help out with that. So you can talk to uh, Pastor Nathan or Elizabeth if you'd like to send your junior high kids to that retreat. Also, Hidden Acres has already opened up registration for next summer's Bible camps. And so if you've got kids um, anywhere in the Bible camp age, uh, you can go online. Um, 
the, uh, the website is in your bulletin and you can get them signed up um, even now and take advantage of that early bird uh, discount. <coughs> and just so you know, uh, we will be uh, offering scholarships also to help pay for the cost of Bible Camp uh, this, this next year. And then next summer, Daniel and Elizabeth Baxter are hoping to lead a short-term mission trip to Peru uh, at the end of July. And so if you're interested in joining them for that trip, uh, they would love to talk to you about that. So you can email Elizabeth or just talk with Daniel and Elizabeth, and they'd love to get you um, to be part of, that, uh, part of that mission trip. Right now, I'm going to invite the kids forward, and they're going to light the, the fourth Advent candle this morning. All right, come on up, guys. How's everybody today? Pretty excited? Yeah. Hey, come on up, guys. Have a seat. All right. I like your tie. That's pretty good. Cool. We got a couple guys with ties on. Well, you guys dress better than I do. All right, so as you guys know, we've been lighting these candles, right? So today's our fourth one. So. This one is called the Candle of Revelation. That's kind of a big word. Do you guys, does anyone tell me what the word reveal means? Yeah? To show. To show. That's right. How many of you have ever played hide and seek? <coughs> ever played hide and seek? Yeah. Who, what's the person who's hiding? Can you see them with your eyes right away? No, but are they still there? Yeah, they're still there. Have you, all right. How many of you guys have ever gotten a present before? Yeah? When it's wrapped up, can you see what's inside? No. Does that mean there's no presence in there? No, right? That's what reveal is. But when you open it up, right, you reveal your present. Or when you find the person in the closet, when you're playing hide and seek, you found them, right? You revealed them. So that, the Bible tells us that Jesus is like that. If you guys have been listening to Haddon, when he's been teaching us on Sundays, he says in Genesis 3, God said way back at the beginning that I have a present for you, right? Do you remember what the present is? What's God's present? So, yeah, Jesus. Yeah. He calls him the serpent crusher. Right? Because Jesus is going to crush the head of the snake. Who's the snake? Do you remember? Satan. Satan, that's right. So, why do we celebrate Christmas, guys? What are we celebrating? Yeah. Jesus' birth. What did he come to do? You know? Yeah. Yeah, he came to die for us, right? So, the Bible says Jesus was revealed, right? We knew that God was going to give us a present, but we didn't know what it was. Oop. And then in, uh, right after Jesus was born, there's a man named Simeon. Have you guys ever heard of Simeon? No. He's, uh, he was in the temple. You guys know him? Yeah. Hey, I just said that. Right. You guys now know of Simeon. <laughs> um, so God told him, hey, I have a present for you. It's the Messiah. It's Jesus. And uh, he's going to be the light of the world. So how many of you guys have ever been in somewhere where it's so dark you can't see anything? You guys ever been like a cave oh, yeah. or something like that? Yeah? yeah? Yeah. So in Colorado, I'm from Colorado, there's this cave called Cave of the Winds. And you, you go into this cave really deep in the mountainside, and they turn all the lights off so you can't see anything. You can't even see your hand if you put it right here in front of your face. Super dark, right? How many of you guys have ever been in that? Spook cave? Ah, that's a different one, but it's certainly spooky, right? You saw a cave in a book? Yeah. So... It's dark, isn't it? That's what the Bible... I've actually been in a cave. You've actually been in a cave? Was it super dark? Uh, yeah. Yeah. But we had a flashlight. Oh, we had a flashlight, right? So the Bible tells us that our hearts, guys, are like that cave. We can't see anything we're, because we're so full of sin, right? It's like walking around like this. Have you guys ever walked around at night? Maybe you've got to go potty or something? And you kicked the wall because you couldn't see it? Have you ever stubbed your toe or something like that? Yeah. You guys don't get up in the middle of the night, do you? No. That's just for us older people, huh? Do you guys do? Yeah. Yeah, you sleepwalk. Yeah. Yeah. Well, us older people <laughs> sometimes have to get up in the middle of the night and we bonk our toes if we can't see anything, you know? Um, that's what Jesus tells us is like if we walk without him, right? We need a flashlight, like you guys said. So, as we light our candle this morning, let's remember that, right? Because we have the ultimate present, the best present ever, which is Jesus, right? And he's the light. So he says, if you trust me, you won't walk in darkness. And you can see me, and you can see him, right? So let's light our candles, guys. We've got four of them today. And we get, I'm not sure what the uh, significance of the color is, but we get to light the pink one today. Let's see if we can get our, our, our light to go, right? There's our light, see? Okay. There's one. 
you guys remember what the candles were? No. no. Yeah? You weren't here for the first one? Nope. Oh, man. Okay. So we have proclamation. I gotta look them up because I don't even remember. Oh, no! Hold on, hold on. Light the smoke. Here we go. I gotta light the smoke still. All right. Well, thank you guys. Let's uh, head back to your seats. And, um, yeah. And while they're doing that, let's just take a moment and stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord this morning. Good morning, boy. What the No, no, not in shape, my
You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. We will continue worshiping at this time through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Now let's stand together and read God's word. And right now the kids that are three years old through kindergarten can be dismissed for their time in Children's Church. We start by reading our fighter verse together for this week. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. After Paul spends about 57 verses telling us about the hope of the resurrection, he says this. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. In the light of eternity, our labor in the Lord is not in vain. And then the scripture passage for this morning's message is Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Matthew writes, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in the dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are worthy of all of our worship, all of our treasures, all of our gifts, all that we have to give to you. You are worthy of it. You are the, the King of the Jews, the Messiah, the very Son of God. And so, Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts even now to help us to, to worship you more and more with our lives. And I pray that we would experience the, the joy that the wise men experienced because you, Lord Jesus, have come to be our Savior. And so would you speak to us now, open up our ears and our hearts to your word. We pray this in, in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Over in Luke chapter 2, when the angel appeared to the shepherds outside of Bethlehem, he told the shepherds that the birth of Jesus is good news of great joy. The coming of Christ is meant to fill our lives with joy. God wants us to be joyful Christians. He sent His Son to give us great joy. 
At Christmas time, when there are presents to open and family gatherings and good food to eat and warm memories, it might seem like it's easy to feel joyful, at least for a little while. But we all know, of course, that the happiness that's brought by those things doesn't last. Now, don't get me wrong. It's good to enjoy time with your family. It's good to enjoy good food and Christmas dinner and so forth. But all of that isn't going to sustain anyone's joy all year long. It's not going to sustain our joy when life is hard, when life is painful. We need a deeper joy, a joy that will last, a joy that will sustain us in good times and bad. We need a joy that only God himself can give. And that's just the kind of joy that we can have because Jesus, the Son of God, is born. It's because Christ has come into the world that we can be truly joyful people. Not just during Christmas time when we're eating Christmas cookies, but all year long, all through the year. When not just when life is good, but even when life is painful. I want more of that kind of joy. I want more of it for my own life. That long-lasting, life-sustaining joy. And I hope that you want more of that too. And this passage in Matthew 2 points us in the right direction. The wise men have a lot of wisdom to share with us about how we can be truly joyful people. As we approach this text this morning, we're going to see a contrast. We're going to see a huge contrast between the wise men and King Herod. They respond to the good news about the birth of Christ in completely different ways. And we need to think together about the reasons why Herod responded in the way that he did, and about why the wise men responded in the way that they did. And as we do that, Matthew is going to show us how Christ can give us the true joy that our hearts long for. How, how, how we can grow in that true joy. And so Matthew 2 begins by telling us that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, as we begin, let's ask the question, what do we know about these wise men? What can, we, what can we learn about the, the wise men? Well, verse 1 tells us, that, tells us that they were from the east. So they were probably from somewhere like Babylon or Persia or maybe Arabia. We don't know exactly where they came from. But it's pretty clear that they were Gentiles. These were not Jewish men who, uh, who have been uh, living in expectation of the Messiah for their whole lives. These are Gentiles. In fact... The Greek text tells us that these men are magi, which means that these are men who practice astrology. Astrology, of course, was condemned in the Old Testament. Astrology is very similar to, to fortune telling. Astrologers are people who look for signs from heaven in the stars. It's very superstitious. It's always connected with the worship of false gods. And we tend to think that there were three of them because they offered three gifts to Jesus, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But the reality is that we don't know how many there were. The text doesn't tell us. And the fact is that they probably were not kings either. When we sing, we three kings of Orient are, that's completely speculative. We don't know how many there were. There were. We don't know if they were kings. They probably weren't. All we know is that these are Gentile astrologers. <laughs> they are very unlikely people to come and worship the newborn king. But God in his mercy has somehow communicated to them that they need to follow this particular star so that they can go and worship the newborn king of the Jews. It's remarkable. And so as these wise men from the east roll into Jerusalem on their camels, asking where they could find the newborn king, verse 3 says that when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Now that's really a strange response, isn't it? Herod knew, and all Jerusalem knew, that the Old Testament had prophesied about the Messiah, the Christ. And the Old Testament foretold that, Jesus, that, that he would come as the king of the Jews. It said that he would be a descendant of David, that he would come to reign over God's people forever, that he would come as a savior to redeem God's people. In fact, the Old Testament even says, and, and Herod and the people of Jerusalem didn't get this, but, but it actually says in Isaiah and in Micah and elsewhere that he would be God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God 
with us. And so, when the news gets out in Jerusalem that the king of the Jews has been born, they should be having a celebration in Jerusalem. But instead, they're troubled. And especially King Herod is troubled. That's a really strange response. Just imagine if you shared with a friend that you had just been given a great promotion at work, and you're really excited about this promotion that you've been given. And your friend that you're telling this to is troubled. He's troubled to hear about this great news. That would be a really strange response for me. Or imagine if you called a friend and, and, and you told her that your daughter just got engaged to a wonderful Christian young man, and you're, you're so excited about it, and your friend is troubled. Again, you would be scratching your head. That's a, that's a really odd response to good news. Here there is great news. The Messiah has been born. The Savior has come. Jerusalem should be celebrating. Herod should be jumping for joy. But instead, they're troubled. Why is this? Well, let's think a little bit about Herod. History tells us that about 35 years earlier, he had actually been given the title King of the Jews. He was given that title by the Roman government. He had bribed and connived his way into being uh, given this title. And so if this child has now been born as the king of the Jews, then Herod understood this as a threat to his power. <laughs> and Herod did not like people that threatened his power. In fact, towards the end of his life, Herod became very paranoid, and then he contracted some kind of illness, we don't know exactly what it was, but some kind of illness that made the paranoia even worse. And so he actually had several of his close friends killed. He had his own wife murdered, and two of, at least two of his sons murdered. And here in Matthew 2, verse 13, tells us that when the wise men had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, and he said to him, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. So Herod wants to kill the Messiah. So think about what's going on in Herod's heart. This man is willing to kill the Messiah. He's willing to try to eliminate the Savior who's been sent from God to rescue God's people just so that he can stay in control for a few, short more, a few more short years. Herod saw Jesus as a threat to the control that he had. Now, in one sense, he was mistaken. Because Jesus had no intention of becoming a, a political ruler. Jesus didn't want to come and just be the ruler of the Jews and sit on a throne in Jerusalem. He had no interest in that. But in, but in another sense, Herod was right. Jesus was a threat to the control that he had. And the reason I say that is because Jesus calls us to surrender the control of ourselves, of our lives, to surrender control of everything to Him. He's the King. He has all the authority. And so the way that, not just Herod, but everyone should respond to Jesus, from Herod all the way to, to you and me, is by submitting ourselves to the authority of King Jesus. And if you read the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, you, you see that Jesus came and he made radical claims on our lives. Let's give you one example of this. In chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, it says that Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now that's a, a radical demand from the king. Deny yourself. It's don't, don't live for yourself anymore. Quit living a self-centered life. And instead, take up your cross, which is this cruel instrument of death, and follow me, Jesus says. It means live under my authority. Live in obedience to my word. This is a call to surrender ourselves completely to the authority of King Jesus. It's a call to invite him to take control of our lives and to put ourselves underneath the authority of Christ himself and underneath, under the authority of his word. And if you think about it, this is simply what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, isn't it? 
A disciple of Jesus is someone who's living under the authority of Christ. The call to discipleship is a call to obey Jesus in every area of our lives, to surrender everything to Him. Remember the Great Commission at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said there, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. A disciple of Jesus is a person who <clears throat> essentially offers their life to Him. A person who is willing to learn all that Jesus commanded and to say, I want to bring my life into conformity to the Word of Christ. I want to live in obedience to Jesus. I'm not in charge. He's my Lord. He's my King. And so Herod is threatened by Jesus. Because if Jesus is the King, then Herod can't have control of and so what's Herod going to do with the true king of the Jews? Well, verse 4, it says that he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people, and he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now this is a prophecy from Micah chapter 5. It was written about 700 years before Jesus was born. And Jesus was, in fact, born in Bethlehem, just as God had promised 700 years earlier. And that's a remarkable thing that this prophecy would be fulfilled like this. But I, I want you to notice here that Herod believes the Bible. Right? He called the scribes, he called, he called the, the Bible scholars and said, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem. Okay, thank you. Herod doesn't dismiss the Bible. He doesn't say that prophecy is not true. No, he believes the prophecies about the Messiah. He believes that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem just as Micah foretold. And yet, even though he believes the Bible, he wants nothing to do with God and with the Son of God. I, I want to point this out because we should all believe the Bible. Absolutely. We should all believe every word of it. I believe every word of this book with all my heart. But you know what? Simply believing it doesn't mean that your heart's in the right place. We need to not only believe the Word of God, we need to surrender ourselves to the King. And so in verses 7 and 8, it tells us that Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I, may, that I too may come and worship him. And of course, that's a lie. Herod doesn't want to worship Jesus. He wants to kill him. And so he's sending the, the, the wise men to find out where Jesus is in hopes that they'll come back and tell him he can eliminate the new king of the Jews. Thankfully, God had other plans. <laughs> but in contrast now to Herod, let's think about the way that the, the wise men are going to respond to the birth of Jesus. It is completely different. 180 degrees, 180 degrees different. And so in verses 9 and 10... It says that after listening to the king, the wise men went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And so these wise men have followed this star for hundreds and hundreds of miles. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, they... When they arrived in Israel, they probably assumed that the newborn king would be found in Jerusalem, the capital city. It's a logical place to find the, the, the newborn king. But now the star has reappeared to lead them the last six or seven miles of the journey to Bethlehem. And of course, they are overjoyed when they see the star. And did you notice in verse 10 how it describes the joy of the wise men? They weren't just kind of happy. They didn't just say, oh, there's a star. How nice. Let's follow it. No, it, and they, were, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. The text uses four words there. And it's, it's, it's emphasizing that they are incredibly happy. I, I, I can imagine that they're dancing for joy because they've seen this star. Why are they so ecstatic about seeing it? It's not because they're interested in stargazing. 
It's not because they're interested in astronomy. It's because the star is leading them to Jesus. Verse 2 told us that they came to worship Jesus, and now God is leading them the last leg of the, uh, on the last leg of the journey straight to the newborn king. And so they go and worship Jesus now. Verses 11 and 12, And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in the dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now, let me ask the question at this point. What can we learn from the joy of the wise men? Herod, on the one hand, is troubled by the news of Jesus' birth. The wise men are overjoyed to meet him. Why is there such a difference between them? What should we learn here? Well, look at what the wise men are doing in verse 11. First of all, it tells us that they're worshiping Jesus. Somehow they realize that this is no ordinary child, not even a, 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 a royal child. They realize that this child is divine. This is God in the flesh. The end of Matthew 1 tells us in verse 23 that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And of course, the proper response when you see God himself in a manger is to worship him. And after they worshipped him, think about what they did. They offered him very expensive gifts. Gold is obviously very, very valuable. Frankincense and myrrh are expensive spices or perfumes. And so apparently, apparently these men have brought treasure chests with them on this long journey, and they're opening up their treasures now, and they're presenting these gifts to the baby king. Now, what does that tell us about Jesus? As they're giving him their treasures, what does this actually say about him? What does it communicate about him? It says that Jesus is far more valuable than even these incredibly expensive gifts. Jesus is a far greater treasure. This week, when you give Christmas presents to your spouse or to your kids or to your parents or anyone else, what are you saying with that gift? What are you communicating as you hand that person that gift? You're saying, you're valuable to me. I treasure you. I treasure you enough that I want to give you this gift. Now, who's more valuable? The gift itself or the person that you're giving it to? Obviously, the person you're giving the gift to is more valuable than the gift itself. In fact, if you spend a lot of money on the gift that that you give to someone, it usually means that that person is incredibly valuable to you. You don't buy expensive jewelry for your third cousin twice removed. But you may buy expensive jewelry for your wife because she's so valuable to you, because she's your treasure. If these wise men are giving extravagantly expensive gifts to this child that they've never even met before, then that means that he is a far greater treasure than gold, frankincense, or myrrh, or anything else that they could give. And this is why they're overjoyed. It's, they are filled with joy because now they have met Jesus, and now that they've met Jesus, they have found the greatest treasure of all. This is what's bringing them so much joy. They have met the greatest treasure in the world. He's more valuable, more precious than anything else in the universe. And his name is Jesus. Later in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus told a parable that, that makes this very point. That when you find the greatest treasure of all, then you have found true joy. In Matthew 13, 44, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy... He goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And so just imagine this in your mind. You can picture it, right? Here's a man walking in a field. And as he's walking through the field, he, he stumbles over something. He almost trips and falls down. He looks back and he's saying, what, what was that that I tripped over? And he sees that there's a treasure chest half buried in the ground. And he digs it up and he, and he opens it up. And he finds that this treasure chest is filled with unimaginable riches. And he knows that if I can buy this field, then all of this treasure will be mine. 
And in order to buy that field, he, he needs to sell everything else that he owns. He can't just go home and find a little bit of money and go buy the field. He, he needs to sell everything. He needs to, to liquidate his assets. And so as he goes and, and does that, is he downcast? Is he sad? Is he despairing because he has to sell everything that he owns in order to gain a treasure that's worth a thousand times more? <laughs> well, of course not. Jesus says here, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys the field. He's excited to get rid of everything that he has so that he can have a far more valuable treasure. And in Matthew 13, Jesus is saying, but that's what it's like to find the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, it's a joy to leave behind everything else in order to take hold of a far greater treasure. Back in chapter 2 of Matthew, the wise men are a living picture of that joy. I think that the, the wise men are just such, such a wonderful real-life illustration of that parable. They have found not just the kingdom of heaven, they found the king of the kingdom. And in their joy, they're emptying out their treasure chests, they're laying their treasure before King Jesus, because he is a far greater treasure than gold, frankincense, myrrh, anything else. And Matthew is showing us here that meeting Jesus, knowing Jesus, having Jesus as your own, is such a great joy that it's worth it to let go of everything else in order to have Him. Now, one reason that this is really important is because we've seen this morning that the Son of God makes radical claims on our lives. He calls us to surrender control of ourselves to Him. He calls us to submit to His authority so that He can reign as a king over our lives. Jesus calls us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, to follow Him. In other words, to live for Jesus and not live for ourselves anymore, no matter the cost. Jesus calls us to learn His Word, to obey it, not just on Sundays, but in every different area of our lives. And of course, these radical demands troubled Herod because he wanted to be the king, not Jesus. But here's what the wise men are showing us. They're showing us that it is joy to surrender to King Jesus. They're showing us that it is joy to bow before him as your king and to submit to his rule over your life. It is joy to to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus and to live for Him and not live for yourself. I think that, I think that when we hear Jesus' call to, to discipleship and this call to obey His Word and to surrender control of our lives to Him, what, what's the natural response to that? We don't want to do it, right? I mean, who in their own flesh wants to say, oh yeah, I'll give control of my life completely to someone else? No, we like having control of our lives, or at least thinking that we have control of our lives. We really don't. But our sinful flesh does not like to submit to the authority of Christ. And even as a believer, when we hear these radical demands from Jesus, take up your cross, follow me, how do we tend to respond? We might think, well, you know what? I'll deny myself not live for myself anymore, live for Jesus, because that's what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. <laughs> I will surrender myself to Jesus because that's my, that's my duty. That's what I'm obligated to do. I want to be a good Christian, and so I'm supposed to, to live this way. You know what? That's not the way that we're meant to hear these radical demands from Jesus. It's just a duty, a joyless obligation. Instead, we should hear these calls to follow Jesus, to deny ourselves, to take up, take up our cross and follow Him, we should hear this as an invitation to pursue our joy in Christ. We should hear this as an invitation to pursue a truly joyful life. That is, deny yourself and take up your cross so that you can have more of Jesus. Surrender to Him. Submit to His authority. Because this is the pathway of joy. You get to know Jesus more. And He's the greatest treasure of all. 
He's the greatest joy of all. And so when you think about following Jesus and living as a disciple, and obeying the king, don't think of this as just a joyless duty that we're just obligated to do. No, think of this as the most joyful way to live because that's what it really is. This is the way that we get to enjoy more of Christ and that is the greatest pleasure of all. When you submit your life and your heart and your everything to King Jesus, in place of everything that you give up, you get more of Christ. And he is a far more precious treasure. The Apostle Paul wrote about this in, in Scripture. This was his experience. Paul was a man who lived a life of surrender to Jesus, and he found that that was the pathway of joy. Listen to Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. He said, But whatever gain I had, I count this loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. Do you hear his joy in those words? He's saying everything else is loss because of the surpassing worth. That is the far greater value of knowing Christ. He's my treasure. He's my joy. I've given up everything in order to gain Christ. I've sold everything that I have in order to get the field with the treasure in it. Because Jesus is my treasure. And he's far more valuable than anything. This is meant to be every believer's experience. To know Christ as our greatest treasure, as our deepest joy. And so let me pause for a moment and just, just ask the question. So what is it about Jesus that makes him such a precious treasure? I mean, we, we know he's great and that we should worship him, but why is it that knowing him is such a great joy? Let me just point to a few verses in the Gospel of Matthew that, that answer that question for us. First of all, Jesus is the greatest treasure. He's the greatest joy because he is the Son of God. As it says in chapter 1, verse 23, he is Emmanuel, God with us. And so when you know Christ, you know God himself. The God who is the creator. The God who is the almighty king. The God of steadfast love and faithfulness. The God of mercy and grace. When you know Christ, you know him. And this God came into our world, not just to teach us about how to live, but he knows that we can't live that way perfectly. And so he came, most of all, to give himself, to pay the price for our sins on the cross. Matthew 20, verse 28, Jesus said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Just think about the love that he showed there on the cross. When you see the love of Jesus poured out for us at the cross, does that not fill your heart with joy? He gave his life to pay our ransom, to pay the price we never could pay. He paid an infinite price to atone for our sins. This is the greatest love that the world has ever seen. The world has never seen, seen anything close to this. This is the greatest love in all of history. And in his love... Jesus is committed to spreading this good news, not just, not just holding it back and keeping it for a few people, but spreading it to the very ends of the earth so people from all the nations can hear about him and can experience the, the joy of having him as their Savior. Remember the end of the Gospel of Matthew. What does Jesus call us to do? He calls us to go and make disciples of all the nations. All the peoples, every language, every people group, every last tribe in the world. He wants this good news to be known so that the nations can be saved. In fact, I, I think you see this so beautifully in Matthew 2. Remember who these wise men are. <laughs> these are Gentile astrologers. And yet, God wanted the good news of the birth of his son to go to these pagan idol worshippers so that they could be set free from idol worship and worship the true king and come to know the salvation that's found in Christ. God is so gracious. Christ is so merciful. Oh, what a treasure he is. And in Matthew 24, Jesus taught us that one day he's going to come back 
in power, and in great glory. We're going to see him face to face. And everyone who knows him is going to enjoy his glory forever. This is who Jesus is. He's the, one, he's the son of God who came into our world, who gave his life on a cross, who rose from the dead. The son who is spreading this good news to the nations even now. The son who will come back one day and reign forever and ever. And so there is no doubt that he is the greatest treasure in the universe. Knowing him is the greatest joy of all. Jesus is the greatest of all treasures. And so what should we do with all this? In light of what Matthew teaches us about Herod and about the wise men, and most of all, in light of what Matthew teaches us here about Jesus, how should we live? Well, first of all, I, I think that it's important that you don't live a joyless life of trying to be in control, like Herod did. King Herod had no interest in yielding the control of his life to the true king. And you know what? He missed out. He missed out on the greatest joy of all. If you have never surrendered your life to Christ, then you are missing out. But you can have real and lasting joy. You can have the greatest treasure in the world. You can have eternal life. Don't miss out on this. Jesus Christ gave himself as a ransom for sinners like you and me. And so if you will trust him for the forgiveness of your sins, if you will bow before this king and surrender, then you'll be forgiven. And Jesus will be yours, and you'll live with him forever. And then for every believer here, let me just ask this question. I think it's important to think about this. What part of your life, what part of my life, is not yet surrendered to the King? When you come to Christ, you, you give yourself to Him, you yield control of your life to Him. But, of course, we all know that there are pockets in our lives, little places where we're still trying to hang on to control, where we haven't yet yielded this or that over to Him. It could be an attitude of your heart that needs to change. It might involve some relationship. Maybe even within your own family. Some relationship that you just need to yield it up to the authority of Christ and obey His Word. You might need to acknowledge that you're actually living for yourself in certain ways instead of living for Jesus and that that needs to change. Whatever it is, let me ask you, will you surrender it to King Jesus? Will you surrender whatever it is that you're holding back? Will you give it up to Him? And yield it. And do that for the sake of your joy. Not just because this is an obligation, what we're supposed to do. Yes, but most of all, because this is the way to experience the joy of following Christ. When we let go of whatever we're holding on to, then you know what we can do? Our hands are open so that we can take hold of Christ more deeply. And isn't that what we want at the end of the day? Isn't this what we want? less of self, and more of Christ. And so, let's worship Christ, just like the wise men did. And let's worship Him, not only on Sunday mornings as we meet together, let's worship Him with the gifts of our lives. Just like those wise men opened up their, their treasures and worshipped Him by giving Him their treasures, let's worship Him by giving Him our heart, and our lives, and everything that we are. This is how we worship Jesus in all of life. It's by living under the kingship of Jesus, living under the authority of Christ, and following his word as his disciples. That's how we live a life of worship, and this is how we live a life of joy. There is no more joyful way to live than by following Jesus with all of our hearts, with everything that we are. And then finally, let me just say, Let's not miss out on the, really the personal aspect of this, the, the, the relational aspect of this. When the, wise men around, when the wise men arrived at the house where Jesus was, I can't imagine how joyful they must have been to actually see him face to face. If they were so overjoyed at, at, at seeing the star, then I can't imagine how <laughs> delighted they must have been to actually get to see Jesus himself. There was this face-to-face -face interaction with him. There was a relationship there that they could have because they've come to worship him. 
As we talk about denying ourselves and surrendering ourselves to Jesus and following him in faith and obedience, we need to remember that at the end of the day, what are we seeking? Who are we seeking? We're seeking Jesus himself. We're seeking to grow in our relationship with him. He's the treasure. He's the one that we're pursuing. He is the one who is our joy. And so, as we close this morning, let me just encourage you. Enjoy him. He is our joy. So, enjoy him. Delight yourself in him. Enjoy Jesus himself. Let's take time, not just, as Christmas, not just at Christmas, but all throughout the year, to enjoy Christ himself, to spend time with him, to worship him, to enjoy being in his presence. Our king came into the world, and he died, and he rose. Not only so that we could be delivered from hell, but he did that ultimately so we could have him, and have him forever, and know him deeply, and walk in close personal fellowship with him. And so let's take time, brothers and sisters, to enjoy our Savior, to worship at his feet, and to allow our hearts to spend time delighting in Christ our treasure. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are the priceless treasure that we seek. Nothing compares to you. And it truly is joy to the world that you, the Lord, have come. You've come to give us true, lasting joy that can sustain us every day, even in good times and bad. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to pursue that joy with all of our hearts. Help us to seek your face, Lord Jesus, and to delight ourselves in you. And I pray that out of the abundance of that joy, that we would share the gift of Christ with the world around us, so that we would gladly be able to tell the world that you, Jesus, are the Savior and the Lord and the King who will reign forever. We pray it in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand and to sing with us.
you'd like to pray with someone this morning, there will be a prayer team here at the front by the Christmas tree, and they'd love to spend some time with you today. And I hope to see you back Tuesday night to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Let's go now with God's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.